Oh hi, I'm the Heretic. This video was brought to you by my patrons. I can't thank you enough for how you support me and you support the cause of liberty. Thank you so much, and the future of mankind will thank you too. If there's a topic you would like me to make a video on, just hop into my Patreon page and give me some support. As soon as Winston had dealt with each of the messages, he clipped the speak written corrections to the appropriate copy of the times and pushed them into the pneumatic tube. Then, with a movement which was as nearly as possible unconscious, he crumpled up the original message and any notes that he himself had made and dropped them into the memory hole to be devoured by the flames. Winston, the protagonist of the novel 1984 by George Orwell, was employed in the Ministry of Truth, the ironically titled institution, which, in part, that altered all forms of literature in the interest of the English Socialist Party that was currently in power. When the ironically titled Ministry of Plenty promised chocolate rations wouldn't go below 30 grams and went down to 20, Winston revised the original promise to 20, to give one example. When Big Brother predicted the military actions of their enemies, the original prediction was revised to match the actual results. Winston even muses that the revisions he's asked to do aren't actually lies, since the original claims were bull to begin with. It's no more of a lie than saying the sky is purple is more of a lie than the previous claim that the sky is polka dotted. Whether Winston is correct, I'll let you decide. Regardless, history is altered to suit the preferences of the English Socialist Party. They alter events, even very recent ones, to glorify themselves in such a way that their broken promises are kept and their inaccurate predictions are retroactively made to be true, altering people's perception of reality such that they cannot even remember truth from fiction. Winston, for example, isn't sure if the party even came to power in the 60s or the 30s, as the propaganda says the 30s, and his living memory says the 60s. All this trouble just to alter people's perception of reality, but everything that keeps the status quo going for another five minutes is fair game, as far as English socialism is concerned. 1984 was written by George Orwell as a warning to what could happen with the rising tide of authoritarianism following the conclusion of World War II. It depicts the UK as part of a totalitarian superstate, one in a constant state of war to justify its vast surveillance and police state. The novel was meant to be a prediction, a warning, that any organization with a coercive monopoly on arbitration will spin the narrative, alter events, to make opposition to its rule impossible. History will be rewritten, such that people can never conceive of a time before the party took over. Narratives will be spun about how all was chaos and terror prior to the status quo. Current events will be altered to push the efficacy of the state, all to manipulate people into a frame of moral dependency on the totalitarian structure. Enemies that would tear you limb from limb bray at the gates, you see, and the only thing keeping them at bay are the walls of the state. To question them, or even to outright oppose them, is no different than to advocate for chaos and mayhem. The narrative is so crafted as to make opposition to the government unthinkable. But this is just a story. 1984 was speculative fiction at best, based on the concerns that one man had for the future of mankind. It is current year, after all and the events of 1984 have not happened. More importantly, we aren't the kind of barbaric society that was depicted in 1984. We don't have secret police, people spying on each other, or media that whitewashes and alters history, do we? Well, of course we do. There's many things about American history that we think we know about, but we actually don't. Often a result of propaganda during war and peace, internalized by the populace, and accredited in history textbooks in government schools. World War I and II, for example, put forward Germany and Japan as aggressor nations, against which the rest of the world is merely a passive victim, a damsel in distress held captive by a mad brute fit only to be destroyed. 
ignoring things such as the British Navy blockading Germany before World War I in an obvious provocation. Yet the cause of World War I is attributed to the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the exact mechanisms by which this caused a war is suggested to be unknowable, even though this is obviously bold. In the American Civil War, the mainstream narrative portrays Abraham Lincoln as the great emancipator who rallies America against the rebellious Confederate States of America in a crusade to end slavery once and for all. However, what is omitted, or often left obscure, is that slavery was an ex post facto justification for the Civil War, not even one the Union used as propaganda to garner sympathy for the war effort. No, the Civil War happened because the United States aggressively denied the South's right to disassociate from the Union. Lincoln has made it clear his goal was to keep the Union intact, and if he could do so without freeing a single slave, he would. I mean, for one thing, the Union still held slave-owning states, such as to West Virginia, and the vaunted Emancipation Proclamation was extremely limited in its scope. Not to say that the South was entirely justified in their actions either. Some historical theories argue that the South seceded due to taxation and tariffs. However, the secession documents make little mention of those and instead focus on slavery. If I need to explain why slavery is wrong, then I can't help you. Nevertheless, what the Union did in its war of aggression with the Confederacy is claim its right to force association with others and their willingness to slaughter millions to do so. But it's harder to justify the murder of millions in the cause of suppressing freedom of association. Millions dying to end slavery in the United States makes the Union and Abraham Lincoln sound a lot less barbaric. Outside of wartime, similar distortions of history exist. The Great Depression of the 30s is attributed to unrestricted market excesses in the 20s, with people over-leveraging on debt, resulting in the single greatest and lengthiest economic downturn in American history, second only in length to the Great Recession, from 08 to, well, at the time of this recording. Anyways, as the narrative goes, the Great Depression was alleviated through Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deals, providing government financial stimulus for the economy in addition to the stimulus to the economy that governments going into debt to pay for World War II provided. This is, of course, untrue, as it ignores the real causes of the Great Depression, as well as the real effects of FDR's government spending. The stock market crash of 1929 was due to rapid deflationary policy on the part of the Federal Reserve, but that didn't cause the Great Depression. The true catalyst of the Depression was President Herbert Hoover's protectionist tariffs, which sparked an international trade war. Franklin Roosevelt campaigned on getting the government out of the economy, only to do the opposite in his first 100 days with the New Deal, which not only failed to end the Depression, but prolonged it, as increasing central planning that occurred in the economy restricted production and wealth creation that might have otherwise hastened the Depression's conclusion. Also, I shouldn't have to go into how a destructive war is not at all good for an economy. It's basically just the broken window fallacy, except on a massive scale. Here we can see the state crystallizing its narrative to present itself as the Messiah, an organization which provides stability and prosperity, contrasted with times of laissez-faire, which were dangerous and short-sighted, the government presented as the conquering hero to slay the evil dragon of personal freedom and individual autonomy, a theme repeated yet again in more modern history with the 2008 financial crash. The housing bubble of the OOs and its subsequent burst was a result of financial institutions being over-leveraged on housing loans that had no possibility of being paid back. The reason they had those loans on the books in the first place is because the federal government required mortgage lenders to give housing loans to minorities as a matter of U.S. law. In addition, the Federal Reserve lowered interest rates to give the illusion of easy money and prosperity, while deposit insurance, guaranteed by U.S. law, 
and government-owned corporations like Fannie Mae buying up these toxic assets created a moral hazard for banks to load up on yet more loans, as there was less risk in doing so as a matter of government policy. The mainstream narrative pushed forward is that the housing crash was a result of deregulation, that banks became greedy, and because they had too much liberty, they were able to act selfishly, tricking people into getting loans they could never pay back, even though the bank wouldn't get any money unless the loan was paid back. Yeah, this narrative falls apart really quickly. Nevertheless, it is put forward, and more dangerously, like every one of these other narratives, people believe it. Whether it's World War I, the Civil War, the Great Depression, or the financial crisis, the way these historical events, and so, so much more, are spun shows the same pattern as what George Orwell predicted not even a century ago. In order to hold onto power, governments need to alter events, change reality, declare that 2 plus 2 equals 5, such to render you incapable of trusting your own memory and your own judgment therefore making your ability to perceive reality dependent on the subjective whims and political agendas of petty bureaucrats and Machiavellian politicians, and the state will never do so for your benefit. Ideas truly contrary to their interests in the days of yore were simply censored. Nowadays, that is unnecessary. Such is the prevailing narrative that finding alternative theories or ideas requires extra effort to break through the veil of obscurity, relegating it to inconsequentiality, such that the programming of an unwitting population continues unabated. So thorough is this programming that when so confronted by the truth when it's finally recovered, that other people can't even recognize it as such. So down the memory hole it goes, not necessarily by imperial decree, but by design nonetheless. The problem is, any tower built by an architect who says 2 plus 2 equals 5 will not stand, at least not for very long. The truth matters. You can't just legislate it away, pretend our reality is subjective to our individual perception of it. Our society is built on lies. Lies like how a girl can shoot herself with a gun if her hands are cuffed behind her back. Lies like how the 2016 election was the most important election in our history. Lies like how we need the government to protect our rights. If we forget the lessons of history, we're doomed to repeat them. We're doomed to keep building that damn broken tower over and over again, and each time it falls, it takes with it the hopes, fortunes, and lives of millions of people. The only thing that's changed is that we make the tower bigger each time, so that when it falls, it crushes more people. This is the real danger of the memory hole. Not just in terms of what lessons of history we lose, what solutions we can look back to the past for our modern problems, but the arrogance, the rank hubris, that the priesthood of statism thinks they know what's best. They know with absolute certainty what is right and what is wrong, and they should be trusted with absolute power to alter reality. Maybe the only lesson worth remembering is that we know nothing. Questions? Comments? Critique? What do you think has been lost in the memory hall? How do we fix this? Leave a comment below. Support me on Patreon. Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.